Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody from all over the world. Uh, my name is Xiaoyan Zhen, the coordinator of the current series Air Pollution and Human Health. I would like to welcome you to join our lecture. Um, last week, we had a lecture on chemistry of the atmosphere from the professor Robert McLaren. And today, we are going to have the third lecture, quantifying the health risk of the air pollution challenging from Professor Chen. Uh, before I introduce our honor speaker, I would like to remind you that Canada will switch to the light saving time from this Sunday, March 10th. So that means you have to uh, put your clock one hour forward to catch our, our next week uh, online lecture. If your country doesn't adopt the life saving time, well, for example, um, I'm I'm currently staying in Melbourne, and I'm supposed to have this lecture begin in 12 a.m. today. But it will be one hour early next Wednesday, uh, like at 11 p.m., which I'm I'm happy to see that. Well, uh, so everybody, please keep in mind that the life saving time if you don't want to miss our lecture. All right, um, let me introduce our honor speaker, Professor Jiming Chen uh, from St. Louis University. He's the department chair of the etymology and biostatistics. Professor Chen got his MD from Tongji Medical University, China, and a PhD degree from University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey. Uh, Professor Chen is a well-known environmental epidemiologist and has years of experience working on the air pollution both in China and the US. Uh, his research interests include maternal and child health, global health, environmental health, exposure assessment, indoor and outdoor air pollution. Um, let's give our warm welcome to our speaker, Professor Chen, please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chen. It's very nice of you to uh, have this uh, nice uh, introduction. Uh, it is my pleasure. Okay, you can see my, okay, good, good. Yep. So, for, Professor Mi, uh, Chen, for now we see only the, uh, your internet browser actually. Right. I think when you click on sharing screen, you have um, uh, misclick on this uh, browser. Could you just redo your share screen and click on the PPT, please? Uh, let me... Uh... Maybe you can um, stop the sharing and then restart it again. Okay. okay. So let me sharing. Uh, Perfect. It's okay now? Yeah, it's yeah. perfect. Good. Let's get started. Hello, everyone. It is my pleasure to uh, share today's uh, topic, challenges in quantifying health risk of air pollution. I'm going to uh, cover three components. First, what are the challenges in quantifying air pollution health effects? Second, epidemiological theory for explaining these challenges. And last one, I'm going to use one example to study further, to know further the challenges and the related explanations. In each of, I know that it was uh, several people online. After each component, I'm going to have a brief question answers. Feel free, send me questions and uh, we can discuss this. I, I like, as a teacher, I like informal environment, have a thorough discussions, and then we can uh, no more. First, what are the challenges in quantifying air pollution health effects? This is an old question. In old days, people were talking about, asking about these questions, 
And at that time, the answer is that we did not know the health effects of MBNL pollution. There were two reasons, I think. One, at that time, MBNL pollution level was very low. And there were very limited air pollution epidemiologic study published at that time to tell audience what are the health effects. 30 years later, today, people still are asking these questions, still facing the challenges. And we still see huge differences in the magnitude and the direction of health effects reported caused by the associated with uh, MBNL pollution. Specifically, there were three components. First, we often see weak associations. There are some big studies from developed countries. You can see as a ratio is equals to 1.05, 1.10, that weak associations. And secondly, there was a lots of studies reported and even did not report due to publication bias. There were lots of long significant associations or even negative associations which we are going to discuss in the third part of my lecture today, we can see lactive associations. The last one is exposure uncertainty. As we all know, epi study is in a natural environment. We cannot control study population like we control in the lab we can have a very strict research environment for animals. For example, temperature, we can set up temperature accurately. But the epi study is in the lateral environment and we cannot control participants. Therefore, there are always exposure and certainty in any type of air pollution epidemiology study. Most of the many times people just did not pay enough attention to that. Let's look at uh, weak associations. Here are just a list six major reasons for the weak associations. Let us look at a couple of these. Number one, for example, Declining exposure and no exposure has been existing for many years, especially in the developed countries in the USA, Canada, and Europe. Comparing to developing countries in China, India. Because of this no exposure and long term no exposure and exposure range have been narrow. Therefore, what are we able to see is a very weak associations. This is one of the example. The other example, look at uh, 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 question uh, point three, heterogeneity of factors causing a single medical conditions. Let's take at the preterm birth, one of a serious reproductive health effects. As we all know, MBNL pollution is a very weak risk of factors comparing to gestational diabetes associated uh, preterm birth. Therefore, there are multiple risk of factors involved in preterm birth. Therefore, what we can see, what we can tease out is uh, a health effects of weak risk factors. In this case, it's an MPNL pollution. It's not a gestational diabetes. So these many reasons, 
may be the possibility for the for the weak associations. This is the part one, and uh, generally speaking, we are talking about what are the challenges. Do you have any questions? Let me look at the uh, chat. If you have any questions, and uh, you can type in. If there was no questions, I'm going to, to go on. Okay, let me go on. The second part is the epidemiological theory for explaining these challenges. As we all know, if you take principle of epidemiology, we know that before we reach in causal inference, there were maybe at least these four major possibilities. The number one, lack of precision. Generally speaking, in the field, the people do has been doing a good job in terms of get p value, get a ninety five confidence in the wall, and dealing with type one arrow, type two arrow. Specifically, we may observe an association that does not exist, or may fail to observe the existing association we call the type one arrow, type two arrow. If you look at the published studies, generally speaking, you can identify 95% confidence interval or p-value, whatever. So we did good job on that. The second part is a lack of internal validity, mainly all type of bias. I just share with you, being an epidemiologist for my whole life, for all the studies I'm dealing with is fighting with bias. Specifically confounding, for example, if you launch any air pollution epidemiology study, you got to deal with this confounding. And uh, the by definition is simple, but in real world situations, has been very challenged. We are going to detail this later on. The second part is information bias, measurements, errors. For example, if you are launching a case control study, after you chose cases and the controls, you are looking back of their exposure. In this situation, you got to be very careful about the information bias. Specifically, we call in bias, right? The third one is the selection bias. We always want randomly select the participants. But if, if we do not do a good job, that may involve in the selection bias. The third one is incorrect assessment of the direction of causality. For example, you observe that A causes B, in reality, B causes A. I'll give you an example. Physical activities versus diabetes. If a cross-sectional study results shows that the positive association between physical activity and the prevalence of diabetes, this is sense against our knowledge base, right? It should be the more people, the more physical activity involved for the people, the less diabetes prevalence. It should be like this. On the other hand, why we observe the positive association. When you look at the question further, you know that, oh, when people get diabetes, 
they went to their physicians. The physicians advised the patients, oh, you already have a diabetes, you should participate in more physical activities. Because of the limitation of cross-sectional study, we will not be able to identify temporal relationship. We don't know which one happened first. Is the exposure happened first or outcome happened first? Therefore, we observe this weird, fake association. So this is the part, the question three talking about incorrect assessment of direction of causality. The third one is lack of external, external validity. Generally speaking, if you launch a very nice study in Canada, the results may not apply to the population in India, in South Korea. That type of a lack of external validity you have to be thinking about because maybe the exposure, maybe the genetic pass in South, for the people in South Korea may be different from the people in Canada. Or maybe the exposure is different, the cold, risk factors, this distribution may not be different, may not, may be different. So these type of things you have to think about, think through before you reach causal inference. Let's look at further about the bias. By definition, bias is that that, that deviations of results or inferences from the truth. Any trend in the collection, analysis, interpretation, publication, and the review of data that can lead to conclusion that are systematically different from the truth. The key word is systematically different from the truth. So, Let's look at one example of a selection bias. The observed association in the study sample is different from the association in the source population. This is easily, this is easily to understand. Selection into the study is affected both by the exposure and outcome. So that two population, your study population, the exposure and outcome and the genetic components, culture, society setting may be totally different. So when we try to make your results generalizable, you've got to be very careful. Exposure and certainty. Uh, as I already stated, happy study, for example, nowadays people publish a study with 100,000 participants. Uh, recently, there were even 50 million participants study. How are you going to get uh, accurate exposure information? Ideal situation is that you ask every participant wearing personal monitor, get the most accurate exposure data. But in reality, we just cannot do that. That's the enormous amount of money. Nobody be able to do that. Therefore, for any type of air pollution epidemiological study, to my standpoint, there were always exposure uncertainty. So when we try to explain, when we face the challenges in quantifying health effects of ambient pollution, you got including in this exposure uncertainty into this scenario. So that's the, uh, again, generalizability is a judgment. We have to be very careful. Consider if the same biological social mechanisms apply in the target population as in the source population. 
And secondly, consider if the prevalence of factors that may modify the effects of the exposure is different in the target population and in the source population. I'm a Chinese. I work in China after graduate from medical school. I work in China for 11 years. I participate in several big MBNL pollution study in China. Since I immigrated to the United States, I also participated in the several big air pollution epidemiologic study. I know that there have been argued that why, generally speaking, MBNL pollution level in China is seven to 10 times higher than the pollution level in the typical US cities. But in many situations, we observe the health effects is, is comparable. Some of studies shows that. For example, 12 years ago, HEI sponsors a mortality time series study. We conducted this time series study in Wuhan, in Bangkok, in Hong Kong, in Shanghai. The conclusion from HEI is that the health effects observed for these four Asia cities were comparable to the health effects estimated from North America. That's the conclusion, but as a scientist, we have to ask ourselves, is, is this true? Taking into account all what we are talking about, so that's the, uh, to me, is still, we are not in a very bad position, give a definite answer there. That's the reason we need scientists in this field, generations by generations, continuing this type of study. So when we talk about the challenges, I would like, let us recall HEAL criteria. These criteria were developed in 1965. But until now, more than 50 years later, for any, to my knowledge, any type of epidemiologic causes, graduate level courses, we still, we need to repeatedly emphasize this concept to the students. For example, temporality, strength of association, biological gradients. Why in this field, MBNL pollution epidemiology is always interested in those response relationships. Why we are always interested in exposure healthy effects. There was a theory support of this action, which is in this case is biological gradient. So consistency, plausibility, coherence, specificity, analogy, experiment. All these concepts still play such an important role guiding us to explain the results, especially dealing with the differences in the magnitude and the direction of the health effects. Let's look at uh, one, uh, each of these uh, briefly one by one, temporality, or we call the time sequence. Exposure precedes development of disease by a period consistent with proposed biological mechanisms. We have to keep this in mind. However, in reality, we are reading lots of studies using cross-sectional study design in air pollution epidemiology study. Therefore, we know that the number one, if we can say, limitation for any cross-sectional study is that the investigator are not be able to identify temporal relationship. 
because of limitation of this study design. In other words, we don't know is the exposure occurred first or outcome occurred first. This is uh, a big issue, but sometimes people forget about this temporal relationship. When we reading a cross-sectional study results, strength of association, again, because of the nature of exposure in L pollution epidemiology the study, which in many cases, especially in this in the environment from a developed country, is a long term no exposure. Therefore, the association we expect would be very weak. So this is the uh, we got to keep this in mind. Biological gradients, those response relationship, this evidence is so important for policymaker to develop a standards. If we are able to identify those response relationship, for example, linear relationship, is there any threshold? If this evidence we are able to identify, that help a policymaker to develop a standard, set up an environment a standard. But unfortunately, many situations we are still very limited to identify the shape of those response relationships. Some of studies shows a oh, mortality relationship with the PM 2.5 is a linear relationship. But some of study actually did not show linear relationship. It's other types of uh, those response relationship. Therefore, I still remember 10 and 15 years ago, scientists from industrial side had a fighting with scientists from EPA, from universities. This fight happened in the US Congress because EPA scientists, universities, professors, they argue that so far the evidence support revised the national environmental standards. Generally speaking, they want more strict environment standards. On the other hand, the scientists from industrial side, for example, Exmobil, they argue that no, 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 the evidence still is not ample, it's not enough because we even do not know the shape of uh, those response relationships. In other words, we don't know the threshold for several of key criteria and vinyl pollutants. Therefore, we need to hold on before we make a, a revision of environment, national environment standards. So this is very important part. Therefore, as a researcher, if we, if there was any opportunity, we should explore, put our effort to identify those response relationship. This is a stronger evidence in terms of the association. Consistency. This is all, many cases, I always ask my students, do you see the results from this individual study? Is there any consistency with those results published previously? If there was, if really there was association, for example, between ambient ozone exposure with preterm birth, with stroke, for example, it got to be consistent results existing there from different country, from different participants, from different uh, investigators. So this is also very important. 
plausibility that were known and postulated by logical mechanisms that help explain exposure disease relationship. You put a lot of effort to write your grant's proposal, to go to field collecting data, to, to do the data analysis. You get your results, and you got to see your results. Is there any postulated biological mechanisms help you to explain your results? If yes, that's good. If no, what is the reason? Many of the big findings, important findings, come out from these processes. So coherence, association must not seriously conflict with what we already know about the natural history or biological of diseases. This is also a very important part, specificity. You know, for metal health effects, we are able to identify biological markers, for example, lead exposure. And Dr. Jin is an expert on that, and Hui is also an expert on that, Dr. Dan. But many nowadays, and we are talking about the stroke, diabetes, mortality, preterm birth, this specificity is getting more challenge for us to identify biomarkers. What is the biomarkers, for example, for diabetes associated with PM2.5? It, it, it's getting challenged. So again, remember this uh, HEAL criteria was proposed in 1965. But still, this criteria is, uh, is, is, a, is important guideline for us. Analogy, analogy. Evidence exists that similar exposures may have similar effects. For example, heavy metal and toxic effects. So there was some analogy there. And the experiment. Natural experiments provide evidence for exposure disease relationship. As an epidemiologist, we, I always share with my people and with my students, if you are able to identify an ideal study site or ideal study population, you are halfway successful. I can give you two examples. Everyone knows Arden Pop, right? He had a big name. When I was young, I read his paper, published in Utah. There was a, a steel factory in Utah Valley. When the factory run, was running, MBNL pollution higher. When the steel factory is closed down, the MBNL pollution down and mortality, all type of lung function, health effects. There was an association with that. It is not, it is bad for the residents in Utah Valley in the USA, but it's a, such a nice natural experiment study size, right? These study series of papers provided a strong evidence for us to know the health effects of MBNL pollution. And that there was some other, London Smart. People know that. At that time, this is the sort of a beginning of modern MBNL pollution epidemiology. Because that small, mortality is associated with the heavy MBNL pollution level. So people know that at that time more, much better than previously. Oh, pollutants causes may cause such a serious health effects. 
which was mortality at that time. So that type of uh, natural experiment size is very important. I know that Dr. Jen's group in Guangzhou, you, you always, you put a lot of life, life effort to identify a good study size in China, right? So that is a theory. There was a theory support this action. Now, really, it's the scientists. They are doing so. Okay, this is my second part of, uh, of my uh, uh, lecture today. Are there any questions for this? Let me check my uh, uh, chat. What is a real life example of an incorrect assessment of direction of causality? Uh, the question is that what is a real life example of an incorrect assessment of the direction of causality? That's a very good question. And uh, let, let us explore this this way. When we talk of health effects direction or causality, right? We are talking about the association, what is a positive association or what it is a negative association, right? So the real world example I identified is a best, one of the best examples is the third parts of my lecture we are going to talk about. For example, this study was done by my friends, my colleagues from UC Irvine. They did a, such a great job in terms of explaining their incorrect assessment of the direction of causality exactly is dealing, is answer your question. I can briefly talk about this. By knowledge, by common sense, Generally speaking, people hypothesize the higher the nitrogen dioxide exposure, the higher the risk of preterm birth or low birth weight babies. Is that right? But in reality, the study actually observed that the higher the NB nitrogen dioxide is associated with reduced risk of preterm birth. That's opposite observations. What is the reason? This is the third part. The last part, I'm going to explain this. Just bear with me for a couple of minutes. So any other questions? Generally, studies are conducted in specific locations, but in order to have a big picture perspective, we may need to have an idea globally. How could we connect a local observation and global outcome? In other words, how to overcome the lack of external validity? Yes, that's the... Uh, that's very. Uh, that's a very good question. Actually, I can see a lot of thinking there. As I said, that if one study occurred from Dr. Zheng's group, for example, in several cities in China, you may have a representative sample for the Chinese population, but. The results, when we apply your results globally, you got to be very careful. Number one, the race is different, right? We, our race, Chinese, is different from Caucasian, it's different from, from American, uh, African American. Genetic parts is different, and the culture may be different. 
for example, if, if the results, if you study Chinese women, generally speaking, the women not only exposed to outdoor pollution, many cases, especially in rural areas in China, the women also exposed to indoor pollution when they were cooking. The cooking ways is totally different from a Western size way. So this type of time activity pattern differences, cultural differences, in other words, exposure distribution differences, and other risk factors distribution may be different. So we got to think about this before we are, we are explain these challenges. Okay, because of time, let's uh, move on. And uh, thank you for your questions. This is a very good, uh, two good, very good questions. And uh, I wish I have more time to discuss further with these two questions. Okay, good. Again, this study is from uh, California, and uh, the investigators, they're very good one. They're using four hospitals from the Memorial Care System, getting data from 1997 to 2006. And these hospitals are located in Los Angeles County and Orange counties. So it's cover a uh, wide areas. So the study included a total of uh, 105,092 neonatal births. So as I already talked about a little bit, it is common for us to observe the lactive association or non-significant association in air pollution epidemiology study. How to explain these results? Let's look at this specific example. And uh, I already list a reference there. If you want to get more information, so you can read this paper. Uh, it's published already uh, uh, six years ago. The hypothesis, as we said, that air pollution epidemiologic study is a hypothesis-driven study. The investigators hypothesized increased the concentration of these pollutants are associated with increased risk, increased rate of low birth weight. In other words, the higher the PM 2.5, the higher incidence rates of no birth weight babies, right? And this hypothesis is, is, is similar to the hypothesis listed here. Increase the concentration of these pollutants associated with decreased birth weight in grams. In other words, the higher the ambient pollution, more the lighter weight babies were born. That's the similar hypothesis. I'm not going to detail these studies and uh, let, let us look at the summary of the major results and then let's see how the investigators, they did a, such a nice job to explain this uh, incorrect assessment of direction of health effects as the question raised. Increased immune birth weight in grants was associated with increased concentration in most air pollutants. This results, it seems like the ambient pollution play a protect effects in terms of low birth weight, which is against human beings' knowledge, right? MBL pollution is a bad thing. Why is act like a protection effect? It's totally opposite the direction of the association. The second one, low birth weight rate 
was negative associated with nitrogen dioxide, for example. In other words, the higher the nitrogen dioxide is associated with lower risk of no birth weight babies, which again, against to the knowledge of human beings knows. It's supposed to be higher than nitrogen dioxide is associated, increase the no birth weight babies, right? Let's see how the investigators explain these weird observations. Uh, this table also shows the, uh, general speaking, this summary of the results. I highlighted these results in the, in, in, in the red. Look at this. Uh, this is odds ratio 0 0.85, which means the negative association. Look at this uh, confidence interval, or less than one, which means statistically significant. I'm not going to talk about other results. That results already summarized here. So let's look at the possible explanations. First, lack of geographic resolution. Remember, this study was conducted in two big counties in California. This and being a pollution, there was a significant variations spatially. So geographic resolution is a critical issue for pollutants like a carbon monoxide due to a fine scale spatial variations. In other words, carbon monoxide can vary uh, uh, changed significantly in, in, in the very small areas. Unfortunately, the investigators, they will not be able to get a personal exposure data because of this over 100,000 neonatal birth, that huge study population. They cannot do personal exposure. That may be one of the possible explanations for this weird association. A wrong, or you can say maybe a weird, a weird direction of the association. Number two, impact of local pollution sources. Limited variation in concentration for PM 2.5, as we know that, Sometimes we call PM 2.5 is a regional pollutant, pollutant, meaning that the concentration level remain quite stable in the relatively large areas. However, the composition of PM 2.5 may, may change. Concentration may remain the same, but composition species of the PM 2.5 may be different due to our local pollution sources. This is another reason. The third reason is local and the regional distribution from both traffic and the residential emission. This study did not collect in details data on that. As we all know, Los Angeles County Los Angeles, if you have experience driving in Los Angeles, you will know how much traffic contribution to MBNL pollution pollution. You can actually stay on the road for two hours. My daughter, she's in Los Angeles. She always complain how bad the traffic over there. So that pollution, that traffic pollution, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, such an important pollution source to the study population. Number four, limited measurements. As we all know, pregnant women were exposed to multiple pollutants simultaneously. Not only to these six 
criteria unbeing air pollutants, but also to many other toxic pollutants in the air. But there was no data in this study reporting this type of exposure information. Therefore, there was a big exposure uncertainty. That may be the other reason. Number five, potential exposure misclassification using simple indicators of traffic density and distance of roadways. One set of exposure variables in this study, they use in the traffic density and the distance to the roadway. As we can imagine, this type of exposure construction is not detailed, it's not an ideal one. So they may involve some exposure uh, misclassification there. Number six, no data on time activity patterns. Again, huge population, over 100,000 pregnant women, they did not collect entire activity patterns. Will this woman stay majority of time indoor in the house? Will they, some of the women may have occupational exposure? All this information just to the investigators that did not have this information, therefore there was exposure uncertainty there. And number seven, no data on mother's home address before delivery. Did the mother move during the pregnancy? If they moved, the exposure would be different, right? And the number eight is type one narrow. Again, I, I, I mentioned type one narrow again, is that if the non-hypothesis is true, your study actually reject the non-hypothesis. In other words, there was no association. Actually, you observe the association. This is the type one man. Because this study tests a lot of, run lots of regression, test a lot of associations. Because of that, if we use 5% of type one arrow, we would be able to observe some weird association. And number nine is healthy effects of endodisruptor compounds. Some of now there was hypothesis that PAH, for example, may play an important role in childhood obesity. And also gestational pre-existing diabetes may be also involved in increased birth weight. Now there was a study shows that diabetes mothers more likely deliver overweight babies. If the study population there was a significant proportion of diabetes mothers, they may deliver overweight babies, which overcome the low birth weight babies called associated with MBNL pollution. So it's complicated. In other words, we have to be very careful explaining these challenges. And 11 is possible harvest effects. MBNL pollution causes the miscarriages. Most likely miscarriages babies are low birth weight babies. And then when the baby, other babies delivered, it turned out it's normal, normal weight babies. Therefore, we observe this weird direction of the association. And the number 12 is a measured confounders and the residual confoundings. And this is, a, this is a challenge concept, the residual confounding versus confounding. And because of time, I'm not going to detail this. And you can go Google to Google residual, uh, residual confounding and confounders get explanations. And this is pretty much all. We have five minutes, I think. I'm available to questions. Well, thank you very much, Professor Chen, as wonderful lecture.
and actually I learned a lot and you give us the major challenge we are facing when we link the air pollution and the you know the the uh, the, the worst of uh, the outcome right human human health oh uh, well okay we are open for questions if somebody have questions you can just type your questions on the uh, chat box or you can speak to Professor Chen directly if you have the microphone. You are welcome, uh, Dr. Chen. Thank you for doing your presentation this week. You are welcome. Oh, okay. That's the thank you for the uh, very, yeah. very, right? Uh, okay. Uh, well, I will take advantage of the being a chairman and uh, go with a couple of questions. Well, uh, for we know that when we study or oh, when we investigate the association of the air pollution and the human health, the lot of the, you know confounders right exist in the study. Well, especially for the exposure uh, measurement. Mm -hmm. um, well, from the you know, recent years, research that developed one kind of the method has like the we call them machine learning. They they establish the model and to uh, simulate uh, the air pollution exposure and of course they will validate it. So what do you think about this kind of method could do you know could be um, we can use in our epidemiology you know, study. This kind of yeah. uh, to my knowledge that exposure uncertainty it's one of uh, major issues in air pollution epidemiology. I know that uh, many years ago, for example, US EPA, there was a huge lab. They has been doing the identifying the species of particular matters. Because some of, uh, as you know, as a as a exposure expert, uh, Dr. Jim, some of species are in the gas phase, some of species in liquid phase, some of species maybe solid phase within the particular matter. So they are stable. They are not stable. They they keep changing these phases. So are we going to develop a variable? stable enough could be used in air pollution epidemiology study that's the one effort the other effort i agree with i i know actually i i have a couple of uh, good friends they help me with that uh, 100,000 pregnant women study i i conducted in wuhan china they are very good at the machine simulation or model estimation effects. They, they, they did a great job. I, I, as to tell the truth, epidemiologists, I know very little about this machine simulation, but I know we need to collaborate with this group of experts together. We need improved exposure assessment in air pollution epidemiology study. This is what I can I can I, I can I can share with you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there, there was a question. It is possible to completely control selection bounds or confounding factors. The question is that it is possible to completely control selection bias or confounding factors. There were two questions. To my knowledge, if you want to completely control selection bias, you select everyone into your study. There was no selection bias, right? For example, if you want to study healthy effects of PM2.5 on asthma for all New Yorkers, you investigate each of our residents in New York City, which is more than 20 million people. 
in reality, you cannot do that. Nobody give you huge money to do this. You have to do sample, sampling. Therefore, in some degree, some selection bias, most of the time they were always there. But as a scientist, we need to control to the selection bias to a degree that your results is not invalid. Confounding factors. It's very challenging to my knowledge, you completely control confounding factors. There are several reasons, again, for any of L pollution epidemiology studies, you cannot select every, all data. Diabetes, for example, or a stroke, for example. There are multiple risk factors. I give you an example of that the study I, I conducted pre term birth. There were so many risk factors which associated with pre term birth. It's very, very challenging for you, for any investigators, in the one single study collecting all risk factors, covariance data. This is one reason. Due to the resources, money, or investigators, this is uh, reason one. Reason two is that human beings are limited. With the time, human know more and more about the natural history of medical conditions. Maybe today we do not think this factor is a uh, associated with uh, preterm birth. Maybe 10 years later, oh, these factors, we find that, oh, play such an important role associated with preterm birth. Because many of our risk factors or causations for chronic diseases, we do not know. For example, diabetes. We know it's multiple risk factors. We can list uh, some of them but nobody knows the causation of diabetes. Do you agree? So therefore, it's, it's the completely controlled selection bias. It's to me, I'm not that promising we're able to do that. The other, re the, other the last question is that, has any research look at air quality and the human health of people living near or downstream of volcanic activities. I read studies and uh, down near the volcanic, uh, you know, places many years ago, but I cannot remember. Uh, now, but if you go, I believe you, if you go PubMed, you are able to identify this study. I believe there was a previous study done related to uh, this. And I, I remember I read these papers before, many years ago. Okay, so I think time's up and uh, thank you. And uh, I enjoy the uh, uh, conversation talking with each of you and uh, if you have further questions uh, send me an email I'm glad to have a further discussions well thank you. oh thank you professor Chen says for a wonderful lecture and um, well, I uh, want to remind our audience that the coming lecture will be air particle sampling and collection from Dr. Eric Descarian and also please keep in mind that the light time saving in Canada. Well, thank you, Professor Chen, again. And I'll, I'll see you guys next Wednesday. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank, you. thank you very much again. Uh, please okay. stay in touch. I'm going to send you an email later on. OK. Yeah, thank you for everyone for coming. Yeah. Have, a good, have a good day. See you tomorrow. I'll see you next week, sorry. OK, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.